I wanted to take a bit to write this video, to release this video, to even start critically thinking about this game. If you've watched my previous video on the Borderlands games, you'll know that the series means a great deal to me emotionally and contextually. Borderlands 3 was one of my most anticipated games, not just in a long time, but maybe ever. I lived and breathed Borderlands 2. No inch of that game was unexplored by me. So now I sit here, writing my analysis and review for a game that I genuinely thought may never come out. I had this on my calendar since the moment they announced its existence. My wife Alethea and I had one of our first bonding experiences ever over Borderlands 2. As we grew closer together, one of our biggest inside jokes was that I would propose at the midnight release of Borderlands 3. It was funny because, at the time, it seemed unlikely to ever happen. The release of the game, not the proposal. That definitely happened. Well, now that it's here, it's one of those moments in your life that no matter what, no matter the product, let's be real, it's probably not going to meet your expectations. I was over the moon waiting for this game. Every bad day was just, well, at least Borderlands 3 is on the horizon. You will excuse me if objectivity is not my objective here. So, knowing that, how do I begin to reconcile this game having played it so much over the past month? Is this a good game? Is this a good Borderlands game? Does it not only deliver on the same gameplay loop that hooked me from the first game, but the genuinely wholesome and emotionally stimulating character-driven stories that can be equal or better than that of Borderlands 2? I think my answer may actually catch you off guard. I don't really know. I genuinely don't know where to place this game in my head. I don't know what kind of review score it would get. I don't know where it ranks amongst the three mainline games. I know so little about my opinion of this game that it gives me insecurity about my abilities as a games writer. I want to tell you every nuanced thought I have about this game. Trust me, I do. And even with that being said, even uncertain readings of games are still, at their core, readings. Valuable readings, even. There is a reason that this game evades my grasp, and I am certain we can figure it out. I am sure of a couple things, however. I did like this game. No part of me wholly disliked this as an addition to the Borderlands universe. There are parts that I did not like, sure, but as a whole, as a product, I liked it. I could even go as far as saying that 75% of the stuff I did not like was tied to the story, the themes, or world, rather than the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay or its systems. I believe Borderlands 3 to be, when it's working, the most mechanically satisfying and rewarding entry into the series. It has everything the series needed in the gameplay department. Put concisely, it prioritizes movement mechanics and combat in such a way that encourages the player to constantly move forward and be aggressive. More on-screen enemies, more approaches to verticality, and more options in combat allow for what I consider to be the best gameplay in the series. Thematically and narratively, I think it both succeeds and fails. I think it continues the series' tradition of questioning and examining the ways in which late-stage capitalism can grow into this grotesque demon of absurdity and oppression. I think it generally does a good job of the broader ideas of how the power-hungry will consume all commodifiable entities, most importantly in this game, other humans. I think it continues the wholesome irreverence that often manifests itself into this subtly beautiful tale of friendship and camaraderie in the face of overwhelming odds and oppression. I think that the characters, the caricatures, continue to contribute to the idea that the Borderlands, that Pandora, is a place worth saving, a place of individuals that are absolutely worth saving and fighting for. Conversely, I also think that a lot of the moment-to-moment -moment plot devices and threads leave more questions and concerns than satisfying narrative catharsis. If you've watched a lot of my videos, you know I tend not to get too caught up in plot holes or even really plot at all come to think about it. But it is undeniable that I found myself going, wait, 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 what? Or, oh, so that happened, I guess. And look, Borderlands is not striving for realism, naturalistic characters, or deep, intricate plot. Borderlands 3, however, intends to expand itself a bit as a story, expand its scope, its plot, and its objectives. There are more missions, characters, plot threads, focuses, political conflicts, corporations, and mixing motivations than in any Borderlands game to this point. With that added complexity comes more opportunities for criticism and failure. I am not really convinced that quantity translates immediately to quality here. As software, Borderlands has reached that weird level with me where almost everything in it feels okay to me. 
It just feels normal, right? Even when it's clearly not. Where some might criticize, I often find this meaningful comfort in its jankiness. It's not unlike the feeling Bethesda games give to longtime fans. I think this is a perfect way of describing my thoughts as a through line throughout the game. NPCs moving their heads around but not their bodies, tracking you creepily. Same character models everywhere, voice actors being shared amongst multiple characters like Captain Flint and Shiv. Even when my eyes roll a full 360 degrees at the writing, it's all home. It's Borderlands. Even though they updated the engine, it still carries a lot of charm left over from Borderlands 2. And as a series fan, I'm thankful for that. I mean, let's be real. Me and Borderlands, we're like two peas in a pod, two bullets in a mag. Furthermore, I'm also sure of this. When I look through the Borderlands games as a whole, I am first and foremost confronted with the fact that, well, they're not for everybody. The games are, without a doubt, a bit divisive over the always compelling internet discourse. You can't really talk about Borderlands 3 without first talking about the near nickelback levels of internet discontent that has permeated every message board and comment section talking about the game. Look, I really want to start off by saying a couple of things that will color our whole interpretation of the game, its themes and philosophies, and of its systems and gameplay. The first thing I want to say is this. I understand if you do not want to play this game or you don't like the series because of any number of reasons. Whether it's the allegations towards Randy, Randy himself, the referential writing, that guy's YouTube channel they took down, the art style, the gameplay loop, the epic game store, or the time stuck memes, Gearbox tends to make their lives a bit harder than it needs to be. Just like with any other video game, you are entitled to disliking it for any reason. I think a lot of these reasons are valid. The second thing I want to say about this subject is, please, for the love of God, please let people enjoy things. I'm not necessarily talking to you as much as just anyone listening. I like this game. Other people like this game a lot. I think that Borderlands 3 is a uniquely special opportunity to talk about games that can reach people differently. Too often we see the collective capital G Gamer, Hive Mind, take over and choose which games to bury and which to lift up as monuments. There is always a game that is chosen as the collective punching bag for that month. Last month's flavor was Borderlands 3. It shouldn't bother you if other people kind of like that flavor. Again, I'm not even saying whether or not Borderlands 3 should be held up as some industry pariah. What I can speak to is my time playing the product itself, separated from the developer, from the controversy. Let me talk for a bit about the software, about the product itself in isolation. Borderlands 3 is a nostalgic game, not because of its gameplay, not because of its graphics, but because I wasn't asked to pay for a godforsaken thing besides what I assume will be expansion content on the same level of Borderlands 2 in the pre-sequel. Borderlands 3 showed me rare cosmetic content that I could earn. Borderlands 3's mechanics, its cosmetics, its loot, its skill, reminds me more of a game like Tony Hawk's Underground than that of Destiny. There's cool stuff everywhere. Secrets, skins, guns, easter eggs, levels, quests, content, all of it attainable once you've purchased the game. Borderlands 3 gave me the sort of youthful enthusiasm that has been all but sucked out of me by every derivative looter shooter that has commodified its content beyond enjoyment. The next time you hear someone complaining about how the games industry has failed the consumer by paywalling everything, by monetizing what was once democratized, by wringing the proverbial sponge of your goodwill, show them, at the very least, the gameplay loop inside of Borderlands 3. Your mileage may vary on the other stuff. My point is this, Borderlands 3 exists as a unique opportunity to look at the ways in which objectivity in games writing is an impossible feat. It seems at this point that everyone has an opinion about this game. I think that's exciting. I think that's good for the industry and for the series. I don't at all consider myself a games reviewer. I don't think what I do has anything to do with me speaking on the quality of a game as a product or whether or not it is worth your time. I will, however, continue to do my best to review this game in this video. Rest assured, there will be so, so much analysis here. So here's my contribution to the conversation. Borderlands 3 as a product is well worth $60. Doubly so if you are a fan of the previous games. There's this phrase you've probably heard a million times over regarding this game. Well, if you liked Borderlands, you'll love this. This is just more Borderlands. Which, while it's hard to disagree with that, 
seems like it's kind of underselling a lot of the improvements in the gameplay and overall scope of the game's setting. I genuinely think there's a world in which someone could have not liked the previous Borderlands games and would enjoy this one. I think the improvements in game flow are that significant. The real caveat to that, and maybe one of the more underrated dark clouds that ruminate over this entire video, is whether or not you can even run the game to an acceptable quality. This game is rough on PC. Unless you're packing some serious heat in the GPU department, expect a lot of navigating back and forth between the video settings menus to try and find the perfect settings for your PC. I have a friend who has all but quit playing the game because he was forced to turn his settings so low to have a, just a playable frame rate. Now I can't speak to the console versions, I'd love to hear, but I have heard that the split screen is awful. Look, this is a serious problem when talking about video games as a product, especially for me who values every single frame in a video game. I was able to find settings that worked for me, but I could easily see this as a deterrent. And the more nefarious underrated consequence of these performance issues is that it's directly in contrast with the improvements to player movement and game flow. The worst offender of this is when you aim down sights with any sort of gun optic. It causes this moment of just absolute Microsoft PowerPoint stuttering. Choppiness in visuals and input can essentially reverse all of the strides made to make the game feel more responsive and progressive. Again, your mileage may vary on this topic, but goodness if it wasn't one of the most disappointing aspects of the game. My first full playthrough of the game and max level character was Zane the Operative. Having played all four characters since, I can't help but feel like Zane is one of the worst in terms of in-game possibilities, and maybe just worst overall. I loved his character, however, and his kit, especially the decoy switching mechanic, is super awesome. If you would indulge my most pedantic of criticisms real quick, I wish the blink mechanic had a little more time in the oven. Oftentimes when I would use it as a dodge uh, from like a big boss attack, the projectile would still curve like Angelina Jolie's bullet and wanted right to my new position. That or the boss would whip around 90 degrees and hit me with a robotic precision. I think it would have been satisfying to see a little more work put into making Zane the skill and movement based Vault Hunter, especially with the obvious added effort into Borderlands 3 bosses. And let me tell you, the bosses in Borderlands 3 might be my biggest improvement and surprise of the whole game. They are so much better in this game than any other entry into the series. They have mechanics, telegraphed attacks, meaningful character, and arenas designed around their fights with gameplay in mind. Borderlands has always suffered with boring bosses, and BL3 is a great step in the right direction. Good job, Gearbox. It will remain to be seen how the in-game content, though, is played out throughout the game's life. The game focuses mainly on a mayhem system that increases difficulty and adds modifiers to the already existing gameplay. I would still like to see dedicated raids added into the game. Not dungeons, real raids. I know it's a lot to ask, but if there's one thing that Bungie has kicked absolute hiney on, it's their approach to raid content. I'm not necessarily saying do that, I'm just saying the desire exists in the market. Let's explore it. The hub ship of Sanctuary 3 is neat, although at times it felt like it could be improved upon a little bit. If I had to choose a comparison to strive toward, like the raids in Destiny to the raids in Borderlands, it would be the hub in Wolfenstein The New Order. Add more compelling story beats and character interactions that can happen organically and throughout cutscenes, and I think Sanctuary 3 has improved a lot. In terms of what I think makes the Borderlands series unique, its characters and story, I don't think that it fails. That being said, I am unsure if it succeeds in the same way that Borderlands 2 did. The main icon that I think most people will focus on in, in terms of comparisons between the two games is Handsome Jack himself, notably when compared to the new villains, the Calypso Twins. Handsome Jack was one of those seminal moments in video game history, a character so charismatically written and immaculately performed. He's one of those characters that comparisons just aren't too helpful with because to do so would really just devalue that which is up against him. I think that is absolutely the case here. The Calypso twins pack their own set of unique, interesting, and thematically consistent intricacies and traits. Just because they are not instantly influential and adored like Jack was does not mean that they aren't effective, clever, and appropriate characters for the story being told. Now trust me, there will be plenty of expanding on these two. Borderlands is at its best when it uses the gameplay to be funny, rather than the writing, that is. I'm reminded of the Boner Farts quest from Borderlands 2 or Face McShooty. When BL3 does this, it does it well and the game is much better for it. 
Without spoiling much, there is a mission called The Trial of Wisdom on Eden 6 that finds its humor through play rather than through writing. It is a very important distinction to make when talking about Gearbox's failed attempts at humor. I will say, ashamedly, however, <laughs> that by far the biggest laugh I got from this game was from a stupid side quest about a stupid guy who lost some of his limbs in combat. His name was Goner Malegis. <laughs> Going forward with our review of its characters and story, the game's scope has increased by a considerable amount, both in length and in locales. The planet-hopping nature of the game both helps and hurts the experience of the story, the former being how it diversifies the experience of its characters and aesthetics, and the latter being how it condenses a lot of the game's characters to being novelties, to being blips of fan service head nods rather than instrumental additions to the resistance and larger narrative. There's a great deal of effort put into making the different planets feel unique from each other, both in narrative and sound design. I think the game succeeds in this way and avoids the other side of the coin, which would be the thematic or ludic whiplash. The verticality of Eden 6 contrasts nicely with a lot of the open landscapes of Pandora. The combat-oriented city streets of Promethea emphasize and encourage the idea that there is a war being fought on every block. Certain levels, like Maya's homeworld of Athena's, are based around shield break and cover-based traditional FPS mechanics. Eden 6 has a lot of health-oriented tanky enemies that move unpredictably. This isn't reading into this either. The developers themselves have publicized the effort they've made toward diversifying the planets, including the interesting idea of having a different composer take on the soundtrack of each planet separately. This all leads to why I think that the adage of, if you like Borderlands, you'll like this, is sort of lazy and dismissive of one's job as a reviewer. Look at it this way. There are two scenarios, right? The first being, you like Borderlands and you don't like this game. It could be the performance issues, totally valid. It could be that you find the sitcom-esque guest appearances of its foundational characters off-putting and boring. It could be you dislike a certain new character. There are, I think, a number of valid reasons that a Borderlands fan could come away from this game feeling disappointed. That certainly wasn't my end experience, but it's worth mentioning. The other scenario, right, is that you don't like Borderlands and you do end up liking Borderlands 3. It could be the heavily improved movement mechanics, the effort to move away from having to play through the game twice to get to end game, or the absolutely important addition of adding two ways to play the game. Classic Borderlands, or crucially a mode with instant salute and level scaling. Did you ever have that problem where you replay the beginning of Borderlands 1 or 2 like 20 times because you had to keep restarting the game to get everyone on the same level? Well, you don't have to do that anymore. I've already heard anecdotally that this change is enough to get people into the series. It could be the added depth in action skills, the difference in in-game content and progression, or because the awesome pro ZD is voicing Vault Hunter Flack. I mean, I think that's valid in particular. My point here is this. I get it. It's easy to say that the fans of Borderlands will like this game and that those who don't probably won't have their mind changed. But couldn't we already kind of figure that out by ourselves? Isn't that glaringly obvious? If there's anything I want you to take away from this initial review of the game, it's that you actually could like this game if you didn't love the previous ones. And I'm sure a number of you Borderlands fans came away a little disappointed from the game. And guess what? I think I like this game a lot. As I said in the beginning, I think I like this game a lot. It is a solid addition to the franchise, and I'm excited to see if Gearbox can achieve the same sort of post-launch content that Borderlands 2 had. I don't have a number to rate the game, but I hope the last bit of the video does as good of a job explaining where I am on the game. But you don't really watch this channel for the reviews, do you? So let's get into that sweet, sweet analysis. Let's take a look at how the game expands on what is what I consider one of the more underrated worlds and atmospheres created in video games right now. My name is David Oz. I write about how I subjectively interpret these games and their contributions to a wider cultural conversation, both inside and out of the gaming industry, and its literary and philosophical merits. You can find me and continue this conversation in the comments, Twitter, on my community Discord, or I'd love to see you in the Twitch stream. All the links are down below. Let's get into it, eh? I won't really spend a whole lot of time, if any at all, summarizing the plot, so be aware that I will be talking as if you know about the game or have played through it. So this is your big spoiler warning. Borderlands 3 takes place seven years after the events of Borderlands 2. The characters are older, they have lived lives that have taken them all sorts of places since discovering the vault map that showed multiple vaults in their galaxy. That vault map is pretty important, and a lot of people want access to it. 
none more so than the murderous duo of Tyrene and Troy Calypso, twin brother and sister who have found themselves in a great deal of internet spotlight. Now, we know how the first game focused on how companies competing for currency can corrupt completely, and how its gameplay and story combine to critique and examine the ubiquitous and all-consuming nature of corporate conglomerates. We also know how the second game focused on how perspective is absolutely imperative when considering who and what is morally and ethically good. Borderlands the pre-sequel expanded on the ideas of perspective and moral relativism and took on the ways in which context dictates how we interpret who we consider the heroes and villains of our stories. In Tales from the Borderlands, despite me not giving it nearly enough time or attention, sorry for that, wraps back into the realm of corporations and capitalism, and how when mixed together with the cult of personality, can create a recipe for financial and social corruption and destruction. It becomes clear to me that Borderlands 3 would act as the intersection of all of these large philosophical themes. Borderlands 3 is the moment that the series' take on capitalism, corporations, and context-dependent heroics all collide in a blood field mayhem. Borderlands 3 wants to study and bring light to a very true fact of our lives in 2019. Corporations are becoming less about the product and more about the person. Where does the money go for a product's advertising budget now? It's not just TV commercials. No, the money goes to Ninja. The money goes to Tim the Tapman, to Nadeshot, to your favorite podcast, to your favorite streamer. In the great chain of capitalism, according to Borderlands, influence has become the currency. There's this part near the beginning of Borderlands 3 where one of our villains, Tyreen, is talking about how she came to be the aspiring, world-dominating internet celebrity that she is today. She begins mentioning just how in which the people of the universe might just be the most untapped resource available to humanity as we speak. Dad told us it was for our own good, that the rest of the universe was full of bandits that would tear us apart. And when we finally got free, it turned out he was right. Yeah, humans are the resource that humans themselves have yet to fully tap into, to properly mine for all of their worth. And see, the thing that is interesting is, Tyreen isn't talking about slavery or the workforce or even, although this certainly will come up later, humans like biological resources one might get from, I, I don't know, munching down on someone. Tyreen is talking about something different. Tyreen is talking about the resource of influence, of control, of the hearts and minds of the greater populace. And trust me, my cynical self immediately thought, ugh, this is just another instance of, we live in a society. It's some internet commenter with an anime profile picture saying that everyone is sheeple and the advertising definitely doesn't work on me. But give me a shot here, because Tyreen is onto something that actually works really, really well in the broader Borderlands universe. Do you remember in the last video how we talked about the ways in which Borderlands games act as a sort of cautionary tale for the possible end games of mega corporations and their influence across humanity? I think Borderlands 3 is really exploring the next step in the logical progression of exaggerated corporate end games. If the previous games were about how corporations can form to essentially reach the civilization style end games of financial and military victories, then this game looks to examine how those corporations are looking to win the game through social and cultural victories as well. I think that the writers of Borderlands 3 have noticed a trend that is relatively unavoidable if you're a daily consumer of internet content. The real money, the real return on investment, appears to be in the form of impressions, in harvesting the max number of eyeballs on screen per dollar as possible. Borderlands 3 is really focusing in on a trend I think we've all seen. The cult of personality on the internet is no longer an exercise in exposure. It's a full-fledged factory. If there is a through line for the entire game, a consistent way of looking at it, it would be that the way the game views influences currency. Now this has always been the case, sure, but it hasn't quite been as democratized as it is today. In the past, influence came from a select amount of people. Movie stars, politicians, etc. It wasn't that one could not monetize their influence, it was that very few people could. Now, with the right mixture of skill, luck, or interests, theoretically anyone could harness the collective hearts and minds of millions of people. 
it is a uniquely 21st century opportunity, one afforded to us by the internet. That's what makes the Tyrene twins super interesting to me, given their upbringing on a remote planet. They were actually kept completely under wraps for most of their lives, completely sheltered, and they still made it work. If you can influence, you can monetize. If you can monetize, you can easily increase your influence. It's this snowball effect that leads Troy and Tyrene to astronomical levels of cult of personality, something that I think Borderlands 3 has a lot of opinions on. Now, this idea of an internet star is as much of a product as it is a serendipitous viral sensation now. Corporations are very much aware of the potency of someone interesting or relatable enough for people to give a crap about them. It is no accident that Will Smith is now a YouTuber or that the NBA is creating vlogging channels for its biggest stars. Internet personality is now less of an endearing happy accident like the Numa Numa guy and more of a full-fledged career opportunity built from the ground up. My mom and I are both teachers. She teaches fourth grade and I taught ninth graders. If there's one thing, one overwhelming similarity between those two vastly different age groups, it's that they relatively ubiquitously want to be internet famous. They want to be makeup YouTubers. They want to be Twitch streamers, Instagram influencers, TikTok stars. They see the money because it is absolutely impossible not to. I get to get paid 500k a month for playing Fortnite eight hours a day? I already do that for free, they'd say. It's bizarre to me how ungendered the aspiration is, how gatekept and at the same time accessible the idea is to basically anyone. The promise of influence, of holding some sort of pull in the public consciousness, is enticing to most anyone and everyone, whether you are willing to admit it or not. Even me making this video is creating some sort of tacit admission that I too want to create communities to earn money off my personality, to influence. I may not think that outwardly, I may say that I am looking to just do this for fun, but whether I admit it or not, I clearly think that what I have to say is something people want to hear. The reason I think this fits well within the universe is because, well, who better than the self-aware, referential, meme-abusing writers of the Borderlands series to take on a topic that is so inextricably linked to the game itself? I mean, think about it. Borderlands 3 is a product. Gearbox is a manufacturer. They themselves literally have flown streamers and YouTubers out to play the game live on their channels. They have a stream team of influential characters in the Borderlands community. They themselves are simultaneously acknowledging the ubiquity of the internet star and harnessing it themselves. It is the culmination of all the self-aware games industry jokes that they've been making in games up until this point. The second I heard Tyreen and Troy's murder cast livestream be interrupted for an ad read from a mattress startup, I knew we were treading on metal lands unknown. It really does color the entire interpretation of the game. You see a lot of the different subplots and character interactions stemming out of the Calypso twins' quest for influence and control. Like how the squirmy CEO of Malawan, Katagawa Jr., essentially uses the influence of the Calypso twins' broadcasts to find the vault hidden on the planet of Promethea. It really isn't some enigmatic reading of the game. It's completely clear. Malawan's CEO is harnessing the hearts and minds of the general population in order to make money and fuel his hedonistic lifestyle. Heavy-handed, sure, but clear. Corporations are using influencers to their own gain, most notably in the games industry. From reports of Ninja getting $1 million to play Apex Legends for a couple hours, to Dr. Disrespect being linked to the marketing of the new Call of Duty game. It is becoming obvious that Gearbox has noticed this trend and intends to also use it as a cautionary tale, much like they did in the previous games. And that's sort of indicative of Borderlands as a whole, is it not? and maybe a reason why players have found the games eye-roll-inducing in the past. They aren't interested in subversive, nuanced critiques of societal conundrums. They are, and this is at the very least thematically and aesthetically consistent, concerned with the turn to 11 extremes of possibility, the textbook definitions of slippery slope arguments. They want to make games that show the worst possible scenario, almost always regarding the subject of capitalism. It's not so different, thematically at least, than that of the 0451 game, a phrase, genre, amorphous descriptor that aims to appropriately bundle up games that spiritually take from the looking glass developed games like Thief and System Shock. One of the defining thematic characteristics of these 0451 games is that they usually deal with some sort of downfall, a downfall attributed to the idea perpetuated by a charismatic, villainous leader of some sort. 
Shodan, Andrew Ryan, Sophia Lamb, Comstock. This really is, I think, the ground that Borderlands 3 is treading on with the Tyrene twins, given how they interact with you mainly through echo logs and radio broadcasts. Their influence, much like in an 0451 villain, is everywhere. They are ubiquitous in the fiction of the game, and it serves to nail home the potency of a truly influential internet icon in 2019. I do think these comparisons are valid, and no, I'm not arguing that Borderlands 3 is an 0451 game. The difference, I think, is that oftentimes these games fall into a trap of decentralizing these ideologies into a binary of extremes. Both Sophia Lamb and Andrew Ryan are both evil. Have you heard of the horseshoe theory? Daisy Fitzroy and Comstock are just cut from the same cloth, man. I don't think that Borderlands does this. I think it's saying, hey, this is greed's fault. Greed stemming from capitalism. That's it. Whether you agree or not, it's still a position. It's why I think, for better or for worse, the games get to avoid a bit of the lazy centrist both extremes are evil criticism many give a lot of these games these days. They aren't really interested in the polarity of discourse. They are interested in cautioning the player to examine a worst case scenario of a real problem that exists in reality. It isn't saying that internet cult of personality is getting this bad. It isn't even saying that it could get this bad. It is saying, however, that there are lessons to be learned about the ways in which capitalism forces even the minds of our fellow humans to be commodified. It asks us to be wary in the ways in which culture reflects the people we put into positions of influence. And, of course, the people we put into power reflects our culture. Add on to that that both of them can literally consume people, cannibalize them for their energy, and we are left with a pretty negative portrayal of those that use influence for their own gain. And I guess that leads me to my final sort of cultural reading of the Calypso twins and the metaphor of their internet influence. I think that if Borderlands 3 takes any sort of political stance in its rhetoric, it's that it views the internet and its influencers as a hotbed for radicalization, as a breeding ground for false empowerment, for a perpetual inflammation of anger-inducing hate mobs. Now, I want to be very clear here, as a reminder and as a throughline for basically my whole channel, I am not encouraging you to understand my readings of these games as mutually agreed upon thematic objectives by the writers. I have no clue if Gearbox intended to make this connection. These are my subjective understandings of a text. This is very much on my mind recently, and I think it is on the mind of many people in the United States especially. I think this point is apt to bring up because to me it seems incredibly difficult to not see the crazed denizens of Pandora and the children of the vault as absolutely analogous to any sort of internet-bred hate group, something that is an undeniable truth to the world as we know it. Alright, here we go. I'm going to get pretty real here, so this is your content warning if you are sensitive to anything placed on screen right now. From mobs to protests to rallies to, and maybe most hauntingly, individuals streaming their own atrocities, in 2019 almost all of these can be traced back to something found on the internet. Almost all of these hateful, terrible people come packaged dealt with a lineage of online radicalization. A slow burn of hatred and bigotry, of self-victimization, almost always stemming from a person or people, non-different than the Calypso twins who constantly encourage violence and togetherness against the other. Many of the people that engage in these behaviors are absolutely in the same online communities, listen to the same podcasts, and the same commentators. Studies have shown that the way that hate groups infiltrate online spaces is no different than that of a cult organization does in the past. Influence is not just currency. Influence can be domestic terrorism, it can be murder, it can be bigotry, it can be internet hate mobs that ruin careers. I feel like one of the biggest themes and objectives of this channel is to explain how, to some, art imitates life in ways that we aren't always quick to pick up on. And I think this is one of them. A story like this doesn't happen by accident. In theme with the exaggerated forms of everything else in the world of Borderlands, so too are the charismatic online personas leading hordes and hordes of supposedly disenfranchised people toward violence and depravity. The Children of the Vault, the name given to Troy and Tyrene's followers, is just an exaggerated version of any other cult of personality we see day in and day out in real everyday life. And you might say, David, it's freaking Borderlands, it's not that deep, bro. But I kind of think it is in this sense. And I think it's mighty risky of Gearbox to feel as if they can tread upon these waters with critical impunity. I do not think that the game should have not been made with these themes in mind. Borderlands actually has a decade-long history of doing this, by the way. 
by taking serious, sometimes extremely depressing societal problems and exaggerating them into absurdity. It isn't unrealistic to think that they absolutely had this on their minds when writing the game. I do think the game brings these ideas to attention. I think it's also incredibly important that the game, to a degree, encourages a direct stance on the subject, that the solution to these problems is to destroy their reach, by way of Ubisoft-style tower climbing, that is, but destroy their, their ideologies, and then, metaphorically or not, destroy the people in charge. My point here is this. The characters in Borderlands 3 do not try and engage Tyrene and Troy in the marketplace of ideas and some ideological battleground of facts and logic. They recognize they are not people to reason with. They recognize they need to fight for their freedom and to prevent their control. In a sense, the objective of this game is to deplatform extremely toxic online personalities. So yeah, in that sense, Borderlands 3 is incredibly rhetorical, incredibly stringent in its commitment to a stance on its subjects it brings up. I respect it in that sense, and I genuinely think you should too, regardless of your position on deplatforming or anything else like that. Trust me, it's weird to me to think of Borderlands like this as well. But when you look at the game favorably, you open your mind a bit and you combine the thematic and narrative confidence with the pro-consumer content rollouts, it does sort of frame Borderlands 3 as a bit of a AAA anomaly. And all of this influencer stuff I'm framing out doesn't mean that all of the other core thematic bedrock of the Borderlands series is gone. No, if anything, they've actually characterized the corporations even more in this game, personifying them and in turn contextualizing their inner industry conflict. Just think to yourself for a bit. This could be a fun experiment. To personify certain giant mega companies in reality, why does Google appear in my head like, I don't like Lady Galadriel in the Fellowship of the Ring when she gets all evil and mad at Frodo? Why does Apple appear like a woman on a fashion runway, sleek, slender, and immaculately made up? Like a character in the Citadel from Mass Effect? Why does Amazon come off as the sleazy, nearing obesity, bald man with a Hawaiian button up with the top button undone, chest hair overflowing? Facebook, I mean, okay, let's be real, we're all just picturing Zuckerberg or a lizard. We can learn a lot about our opinions of these companies by anthropomorphizing them in this way. I'd certainly be curious to know how you would envision these companies in your head, so let me know in the comments. Borderlands does this with the corporations we already know and hate, and I think it adds up to being one of the cooler additions to the game. I finally get to see who is behind Malawan, the person in charge of Jacobs. And they fit. They fit just like your personifications fit your companies today. It must have been so fun to be in the writer's room thinking up some of these characters. Wainwright Jacobs is one of my new favorite characters in the Borderlands series. I think this whole approach to personifying the companies really emphasizes the idea that these corporations are mixing with personalities, that companies and personalities are becoming more and more blurred together, that identities and companies are inextricably linked. This cult of personality that Borderlands 3 is satirizing is linked to its previous satires of capitalism and consumerism. Just think to yourself, in the past, how have you seen certain companies use personality to drive consumerism? What can we learn? What should we learn from seeing a guy like Elon Musk, like Mark Zuckerberg, or Steve Jobs? If Borderlands is saying anything about the ways in which corporations use personality, it's that one should pay close attention. Pay close attention to the ways the person reflects the company, to the ways in which they are used as a personified version of their company. I think Gearbox thinks a lot about this. I think it is anything but subtle that the main corporation that takes the villain role in the game is Malawan, and that the leader of Malawan is as slimy of a tech bro douchebag as you could possibly dream up. Again, I think Gearbox is asking you to carefully consider the ways leadership reflects brands in 2019. Which is, let me say, doubly funny given the face of Gearbox Entertainment, Randy Pitchford, and the myriad of controversy, cringe, memes, and internet jokes that surround this man. Look, if Gearbox is insinuating that these CEOs and owners and outward ambassadors of brands are indicative of the brands themselves, and that we should be inherently skeptical of these ambassadors, then, <laughs> oh my lord, have we reached new heights of non-intentional ironic meta-commentary. Moving on, if you remember from the previous video, we established that Patricia Tannis is the main character of the Borderlands games. Well, I think Borderlands 3 has essentially confirmed this idea and solidified it. In this game... Tannis is a siren. She is a key, meaningful, vital member of the story and acts really as the linchpin for the success of the Resistance. 
I think it really lays home this idea that Borderlands is a series, really, primarily about the sirens. They really are the focus, and in turns, Borderlands 3 really becomes a game about femininity. If you play as a woman vault hunter, the last bit of the game is essentially just about five women as almost the only characters involved in the climax. Yourself, Tannis, Lilith, Ava, and Tyrene. You are helped in large part by Ellie, Moxie, and Tiny Tina as well. Obviously, men like Brick, Vaughn, Sir Hammerlock, and Mordecai, and posthumously Scooter, all add in plenty of input and effort toward the Resistance as well. This is not me saying that men have nothing to do with the game. However, the boots on the ground of the last boss fight are all women. And I think the gender studies-ish reading of the game is super important as well, given the history of social commentary the games have put into its dialogue in the past. It's interesting to see them leaning into it more in terms of plot and narrative, not just saying it out loud in the writing. It is interesting, though, that Troy becomes a siren through Maya, a plot development I thought was actually a little confusing. I guess this is a failure of me to know every bit of Borderlands lore and fiction, but can men become sirens? I mean, clearly they can. Honestly, a lot of the siren stuff is really confusing in this game. How do the powers transfer? Is it proximity-based? Is it how involved they were in the death? I don't know. I don't have all the answers, believe it or not. Maybe one of you can sort the Troy becoming a siren thing out for me. I will say about the game, the siren powers are sort of tossed around so frequently in this game that it does become a little confusing and discouraging on how the siren mechanics actually work in the Borderlands universe. And I guess this brings us to, uh, Ava. Look, Borderlands so far hasn't totally nailed the child character thing. If Tiny Tina counts, then sure, she was awesome. But Pickle and Ava? Yeesh. Look, Ava isn't even that bad and she gets a lot of hate in the community recently. The problem with Ava isn't her character, it's the way her development is communicated, or really how it isn't communicated. A lot happens to Maya's teenage protege in this game. A lot. A lot of changes, a lot of trauma, and a lot of sadness. She is prone to lashing out and getting angry and acting irrationally, which, as a teenager, seems right in line with her character. But as Lilith is careening toward Elpis, she gives Ava control of the ship and of the Crimson Raiders. Why? Why does she get control and not Tannis, or Ellie, or Brick, or Mordecai, or Tiny Tina, or Amara, or Axton, or Claptrap even? It's because she has changed a lot in the fiction of the universe and in the story, but it is not really even communicated to us. We are just supposed to believe that she has matured so much throughout the story. It's frustrating, but I think a good point of evidence when looking at how the Borderlands games tend to cut a lot of corners in the plot and narrative department. A reason why I tend to speak on the wider themes rather than the moment-to-moment -moment stuff in regards to the game. I remain that Ava is not a bad character. She just really needed more. The one real significant quest she does is really, really great, and it does a good job of characterizing her. Do more of that. If anything, Ava's lack of character development is indicative of a wider problem with the ending feeling completely directionless and even rushed, which doesn't really make sense given the eight years between Borderlands games. You see, the game sort of falls off the rails a bit near the end, after doing kind of a lame sequel fake-out joke thing. Well, call me cynical, I just didn't think that this was nearly as funny as Gearbox thought it was. You see, the game sort of ends caught between two separate catastrophes. There's Tyrene trying to open the Great Vault in Pandora, and the fact that Troy sent Pandora's moon, Elpis, literally careening toward Pandora itself. Where it attempts to create an existential crisis, it actually fails to keep the interesting and unique focus the story had up until this point. Once you finish off Tyrene and the Destroyer, there's this really awkward story moment where the characters and the player both go, oh, oh yeah, the moon is coming to kill us all. That's happening too, I, I forgot about that. Then the game ends for real within like five minutes of that happening, as Lilith sort of nonchalantly throws herself at the planet and... Uh, Okay, look, I don't really know what she does. She stops the moon, I guess, and saves everyone. Oh yeah, and dies, I think? What is supposed to be an emotional heroic moment turns out to be a giant missed opportunity in my opinion. Okay, I think I can speak for most big Borderlands fans by saying that most everyone had Lilith being some sort of villain, or at least morally complex figure in the third game. What we got was a really flaccidly unimpactful 20 or so hours from Lilith in particular, with her dying at the end a complete hero because, well, because it seems like that's what the writers wanted to do from the start, and they just threw it in there at the end. I don't know, man, just kind of bummed about this one. 
Maya's death really feels the same way in a lot of ways. It feels completely avoidable, completely contrived, and used more as a device to lift up Ava as a sympathetic character than a responsible or believable character decision. It's also a good example of how the writers use scenarios to villainize the Calypso twins rather than uh, the creative sort of energy and charisma that Handsome Jack had. The Calypso twins, I felt like it sometimes needed these moments to be able to be evil and for us to dislike them. Handsome Jack never needed that. You disliked Handsome Jack the second he talked to you. That being said, the game succeeds so often in its storytelling. I was so happy to be reunited with Sir, Sir Hammerlock and get to see his relationships play out on Eden 6. From a narrative standpoint, that might have been my favorite couple of missions in the game. That's where Borderlands gets me, you know? In contextualizing its characters into real characters I care about. I think that's the real amazing part of this game. I also really do like how the game brings you back to Pandora near the end. It contextualizes it differently knowing what you do now. You really get this feeling of, you know, like Odysseus, returning home with new knowledge, ability, and perspective. It's just such a shame that what should have been, in my opinion at least, foundational characters in the Resistance only show up as fan service cameos. I'm talking about you, Tina, Brick, and Morty. Which brings up the depressing fact that some characters are basically absent, besides a number of audio logs. I don't know, maybe it's contracts or crunch, but where was Salvador, Gage, Krieg, Axton? Disappointing, especially given the time and development. I really don't need every character back in the game, but would have been nice given that the returning characters are already really no more than cameos. Holistically, when I look at the game, I love how it continues its tradition of dealing with the themes and issues with a commitment to taking a stance, with a confidence that says, we want to make a game about these subjects and keep it in the Borderlands universe and aesthetic. I believe we can do both. And while I believe they succeeded, it is always in the back of my head that maybe the eight years and long development cycle had the writers pushing the envelope a little too much. Too many existential catastrophes, too long and drawn out of a third act, and somehow, simultaneously having too much, not having enough of what players wanted in terms of character development and connection. In that sense, I really am at a bit of a crossroads when examining and analyzing, crucially, Borderlands 3 as a game. It simultaneously addresses a lot of the broader themes of capitalism, influence, and the intersections of those two. Yet it somehow manages to crash and burn in regards to a lot of the character interactions and relationships in the game. The truth is, I come away thinking that this game had a number of missed opportunities in the story department. And for every step they made in expanding the size and scope of the game, I think they walked further away from contextualizing, humanizing, and connecting the characters that I know Borderlands fans love. I, for one, was looking forward to an Avengers Endgame style coming together of our friends made in the games up until this point. I, for one, wanted to see Moxie step outside of her bar and interact with other characters in the universe. I wanted to see Salvador, Zero, Maya, and Axton have a drink together after seven years of not seeing each other. Do Lilith and Tina ever talk to each other? Maya and Zero? Look, maybe I'm asking too much, but I really don't think I am. I was hoping for an expansive exploration of these characters and how they would all interact with each other. I know that it's Borderlands, but I can't help but come away feeling like the characters in this game exist 90% of the time to give me quests, that they exist for the player and not the characters. And in that sense, in that specific way, Borderlands 3 is not so different from any other looter shooter. It's critical, I know, but it's how I felt at times. Pair that with some of the joyful mayhem and destruction from the laughs from Connor Molegis, from the grin I got the second I found myself back on Pandora, to the excitement and unceasing glee I had from exploring all of Sir Hammerlock's family dramas. And I exist still so unsure about where I stand on this game. I know I liked it. Hell, it may even just be that I'm older and I just can't connect to a game like I did when I was 17 and first played Borderlands 2. The truth is, though, I'm going to be chewing on this game for a while. And hey, that's not such a bad thing. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching the video today. This video was, um, let's just say, difficult. I've been calling it the Godforsaken Borderlands video to myself a little bit. Not Godforsaken because I dislike the game or because I don't like the video, but Godforsaken because I don't think I have enough fingers on my hands to count 
how many tech issues I had in the creation of this video. So if you're someone who likes, you know, perfectly relevant footage uh, with the points on the video and, you know, perfectly rendered stuff, and I'm just sorry, <laughs> I couldn't be that for you this video. Um, I, I get it. I really do like when the, uh, the points that I'm talking about are substantiated, but this video was really, really hard for me to make. Um, the game itself had tech issues, and uh, so did Dave. Adobe Premiere was not my friend. But um, yeah, usually I just check in after the videos. I wanted to do it in person, talk about the future of the channel, what's going on in my life, all that kind of stuff. Um, my next couple of videos are going to be really interesting. I think they're going to hopefully be the next step that my channel needs. So the next one, I'm doing a collab with another analysis games writer, essay boy, YouTuber. <laughs> Um, and that's going to be really exciting. It's going to be a bit different, um, but you know, not so radically different. I think you guys are going to like it a lot. Um, and then the one after that is going to be just another analysis video over one game. And, uh, I think it's going to be, I think it's highly anticipated. So, um, it'll, it'll complete a series and it's going to be really good that it's done and it's out there. And I have a lot of thoughts. I've already started playing it on twitch a little bit and um if you're a fan of this game i don't know if this is going to be the video for you speaking of twitch you can always come by and say hi in the stream it's been really fun because we'll get people from the youtube channel that come in and say hey i've watched your videos and i really enjoy them um let's talk about this game and we'll, we'll just have strike up a conversation so if you've ever wanted to ask me a question or something the twitch stream is a good place to do it that's all down below. It's also good because it helps me out uh, grow in other platforms and it brings people to the YouTube channel and it can help financially with Twitch Prime subs and stuff like that. So if you've ever wanted to help out the stream in that way, Twitch stream is the best place to do it. Finally, I do have a community to Discord that I've talked about a couple of times. Uh, Discord, I've never really done it until recently and it's kind of a lot of fun. I really like it. So I'm kind of learning how to make my own server. I'm doing it all by myself and uh, it's a good place to just come and hang out with people who also like the videos and talk to me about the videos. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really excited about the channel. I, I really want to make this thing grow. You guys can probably hear the sirens up. But yeah, I'm just, uh, really just trying to get some, uh, Troy and Tyrene levels of internet dominance with this David OZ thing. So let's do that. Let's do that together. All right. <laughs> I'm joking. Thank you so much for watching the video, guys. I really appreciate it. I will see you in the next one. I love you all. Bye.